We're going to have a good night tonight. Amen. 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 Well, night number two of the Power of Faith Conference. Did you enjoy yourself last night with Apostle Reginald Steele? I, I'm... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna be kind publicly, but in the office, I was giving him a hard time. I'm not going to lie. We, we were just messing with each other back and forth, but that's my brother right there. And, and his family is my family. And, and when we walk in here, that's all we are. It's just family. And so in the spirit of that, my brother, my family, we get to call this man dad. And so help us welcome dad, Dr. Mark T. Barkley, to the stage. Come on, sir. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thanks, bud. I love you. Glory. I'm going to get out of your way. <laughs> Amen. Give the Lord a good praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Be seated. Wow. We're having church, aren't we? Well, at least three of you, I guess. I said, we're having church, aren't we? Isn't it great? And, uh, yes. Sinners don't get it, do they? They don't know why you're here. They don't know what you're high on, what you live on. They don't know the Bible, of course. Uh, we wish they would, so that's what we're about doing. Uh, churches like yours and these and mine, and we're telling everybody we can, everywhere we can. Uh, you don't have much time. You better wake up really fast. And get right with God. Amen? Amen? Amen on that. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I call you blessed. It's always good to be with you Amen. and uh, hang out with you. Do a little word. Do a little spirit. Do a little singing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Reginald tried to get me to dance some break dance or something in the back room. And I had to instruct him quickly. I may be your dad, but I'm white. <laughs> and white guys just can't do that. At least this guy can't. But I want to tell you something, I know for sure. Now, on the outside, this is me really getting after it. I'm cutting a rug right here. No. But on the inside, I'm Reginald all the way. Just let me tell you, man. <laughs> Everything in here is working and moving. Oh, it's good to serve God. 1 John chapter 5. Let's get there first. 1 John chapter 5. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm so glad you all get along. And uh, do things together like this. You know, a lot, of, a lot of, almost nobody does what you're doing. That I know of. There's always some deal going on. So when believers can come together, different preachers, different churches, that's pretty cool. I, I love that. And I appreciate that about you. First John chapter 5. If you don't know where that is, it's right after chapter 4. <laughs> We're going to just cut to the chase. Verse 4. For whatsoever, you really can say whosoever. For whatsoever is born of God, oh, I like these next three words. You want to say them with me? Overcometh the world. What is the world? What's that mean? It didn't say the earth. The earth is a planet. The Bible says clearly the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But on this planet, there are two kingdoms, and only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of our God. Amen. I happen to belong to that. Amen. And then there's the kingdom of this world. And it is a human's choice which one you belong to. Amen. Now the sad part is, most people, not everybody, because there are Christian parents, most people are born into the kingdom of this world. That's all they know. That's all they've been taught. And now we're turning our schools all the way down to the third, fourth grade. It's nothing but Satan's youth group. They're mocking our God. They're mocking our scriptures. They're teaching our young people that we're ridiculous. Christians are crazy. Christians are weird. But, but I live on this planet. It seems to me like Christians are the only people, number one, doing it right. Number two, having fun doing it. I know you could be depressed, but we're usually not. And if you get in here and we sing songs like this, this is just like, tew, tew, tew. Right. slaps the world off from you and all of a sudden 
You're singing hallelujah. Pray. Amen. I sing about how I dance, so I keep it real down low. So low. This said, we can overcome the world. The world and the prince of this world, Satan, he's not the king. He's called the prince. There's a difference. The prince of this world offers many ways to medicate yourself. Beat depression by medicating yourself, getting even, holding grudges, walking in on forgiveness. The world has a whole volume, a whole system of methods of what you can do to try to survive as an earthling. But in the kingdom of God, totally opposite. And we can overcome the world. Did you you want me to read it to you again in case you missed it? For whosoever, whatsoever, whosoever is born of God, if you're born again, raise your hand, let me look once, okay? Overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. What's it say? Tell me out loud. Even our our what? Our faith. Hmm. So if I want to overcome the world, its philosophies, its psychologies, that's their gospel. Now it's environmentalist in green. That's their new religion. And so if I want to overcome that, or if you prefer me to say it different, if I don't want that to overcome me and my kids and my life, or say the churches, I, my churches, if I don't want to be overcome by what the world is offering, then I'm going to have to have faith and want by faith or what would I use to overcome all that? A lot of people think like the faith doctrines, the faith message, trust in God, believe in God, the words of your mouth, confession. They're, I've even heard people say, oh, that movement came and went. Well, I'm sorry, darling, that wasn't a movement. That was a revival for a while. But all of those teachings happened before people like Oral Roberts or Kenneth Hagin, the, the ones they aim at and say they, they're the fathers of that. This happened way before that. People were overcoming and beating the elements of the world. Hey, wait a minute. Not just Gog and Magog, but Pharaoh and Egypt, right? And then the Roman Empire, and then, and then, and then, and then, and now. Now. So I want to be an overcomer. You know, the world is kind of, mm-mm. They are. They're They're losing their way. Most of them, not everybody, but you can look around. Most of them, they are like reprobate in their minds. They can't do the math. Two plus two today for them is whatever they want it to be. Maybe you noticed this. Did you notice the question they ask the candidate to be the new Supreme Court justice? What is a woman? And she said, quote, I cannot answer that, unquote. That's where we're going. This is a wonderful woman. This is, a, this is an intelligent woman. Uh, this is a woman who's really proven herself on the bench. Uh, and yet she is going to be a Supreme Court justice. And she cannot define what, to, to the United States what a woman is. Wow, is right. So, you know, the body of Christ, someone asked me this question. Hey, hey, Doc, between right now and the Lord's coming for the church, um, what should we look for? Well, that's what they asked Jesus. You know, Jesus' answer was, uh, he had three things. I'll give you two. He said, one, sodomy. The day of Lot was all about sodomy, homosexuality, to the degree that they charged Lot's house. Two angels were there. They thought they were male men, and they wanted them for that purpose. And this is how low you can get if you snuggle up to the world. And I have seen people get this low, even some preachers. Lot, the Bible says, he vexed his righteous soul. So we know God considered him once upon a time as righteous. But he vexed himself. To the degree, think about this. A dad, I'm a dad, I'm a grandfather, I'm a great-grandfather. A dad offers the whole city, all the men of the city, 
who are sex driven, take my two virgin daughters and you can have them all night long, but leave these two alone. What? Take him out back and deal with him. In fact, just deal with him right there. How low could a dad get? Now, wait a minute. When they, did, when they got out of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know what happened, right? You probably know the story. You're Bible people. I know if you're sitting under these men, you're Bible people. Yeah, they got their dad drunk to have sex with him so they could replenish the earth. I got a question. I always have questions. How do you get your dad drunk if your dad doesn't drink? So obviously, Lot had developed some Sodom and Gomorrah practices that it must be okay to drink, even the wine you're not supposed to touch. Or how would his daughters ever give it to him? You can't trick somebody with real fermented wine because it tastes horrible. Different from nice, sweet, fresh grape juice. So they couldn't have tricked him. They tricked him you know, afterwards, this is how low a man's mind can go when you snuggle up to the world. You ever hear the phrase you have, the grass is green around the other side? That came from Lot. When Abraham said to Lot, his nephew, Abraham said, he said, you know, we're going to get along fine, but your, your servants, employees, and mine, they're, gonna, they're not going to get along. You need to take your share of the herds, and you need to move somewhere else. And Lot said, I'll go outside of Sodom and Gomorrah, because the grass, the valley is greener there. That's where that phrase came from, the grass is greener on the other side. But look what happened. Wow. The second thing that Jesus said would happen just before his coming, he said, I'll come at a time that you think not. How many of you in here are old enough to remember Y2K? The year 2000 and the turn of the century. Woo! Man, was that awesome or what? Everybody went crazy. It was the wildest thing. So I started getting invited to these private preacher summits. You know, 10 preachers, all of them more famous than me, in my opinion. And one of them, there's this long oval table. And if I started naming names, you, you, you would know the names. And I got invited to that. So the host is here, at the, and I'm sitting here, and he decided to go left. So everyone at the table was going to talk about two, three, four, ten 10 minutes on what they see is going to happen at the turn of the century. I mean, we talked about beans, barbed wire, weapons, candles, store up, dig holes, fall out shelters, the Lord's coming, planes going to fall out of the sky, all the trains are going to crash, the sh ships are going to sink, you know, because, you know, of the, of the, of the deal. And uh, I'm listening to all this, all these very smart, intelligent people I respect. And you know what else? They all talked about, this is it. The Lord's probably going to come right about at midnight. So one of my dads in the faith was Dr. Roy Hicks. I don't know if you know that name, but he'd been around many years. He preached, uh, I think, 68 years before he went to heaven. Pentecostal guy. You might, if you're, a, if you're a church history guy or gal, you know the name Amy Semple McPherson, the old Pentecostal, old-time Pentecostal evangelist. That's who did Roy Hicks and Margaret's wedding. So that's how far back he went in Pentecost. So he lived in California. I live in Michigan. He's on pack time. I'm on Eastern time. So, it, so he calls me in the evening. He goes, hey, Brother Barclay. Uh, I said, hey, Doc, teasing him. Did you store up some beans and bacon and, and dig a hole and get ready for, for midnight to come? He goes, no, no, here's how I figure. It's going to happen in Michigan before here. So if midnight happens in Michigan, I'm calling you at 12.01. And if you answer the phone, I'm going to bed. And if not, we got a plan to run down and get us some beans and water. And I thought, go Roy Hicks, man, what a thought. But you know, it got in that big table, it got to me. And they said, well, Doc, what do you got to say? And I remember, I said, I'm going to hold my peace. They said, What? I said, I, I, I'm just going to hold what I feel. No, no, we invited you here on purpose. We want to know what you got to say. 
I said, well, I'll start with this and we'll go from there. I don't believe anything you all just said. I said, now you want me to leave town, I will. They said, no, finish. I said, well, number one, I'm having a really hard time thinking that God Almighty would put the end times climax in the hands of someone like Bill Gates and Microsoft with some clock deal on a computer. Seriously? You know, I can't. I'm sorry, guys. I, I know you all believe it. I'm not insulting you, but just respectfully submitted. God is smarter than that. Amen. Right? And then I said, there's another problem I have. The, the Lord said in the scriptures, he would come at a time you think not. And right now, everybody thinks he's coming. The sinners were looking up. Everybody. I, I heard more preaching. Helen, these preachers were become millionaires writing books on Y2K and how to get the church ready and the Lord's going to come and be ready. I said, no, no, no. It, it can't happen because the Lord said he's not coming at a time we all think it. He's coming at a time we think not. Right? right? Oh, man. But right now, in March of 2022... Almost nobody's looking up. Right. You might be. Most people aren't. That's right. Most people aren't. Most preachers don't even preach on it anymore. There's a whole movement of preachers in our own ranks that don't even believe he's coming. They don't believe in the catching away of the church. Wow. So back then, he's not coming at Y2K. What are you talking about? But right now, we're prime. Sodomy's running wild. Globally, in our countries, there's laws to protect it. You better not even say much about it. In fact, right now, there are right. people that would tell me I'm a hater because I brought up a biblical term, right. Right? right? And so we don't have to argue about that. I mean, that is, that, that's, just, that, that's, in, that's in the earth. That's established. So we can check that one off. And because almost nobody seems to be expecting him to come, I'd say we're pretty prime for his appearance. I don't think most Christians got up this morning and said, Honey, I'm going to go do this and this and that. Now, if the rapture happens before, uh, or the kids. Now, kids, if we get caught up, don't be concerned about it. You won't think anything of it. You'll be overtaken in His glory, and we'll see you in heaven. I think, and I could be judging totally wrong, so forgive me. But I, my take is, I don't think even the hottest Christians on this planet are paying much attention to heaven or the fact that we are primed for his return Amen. to take the church off the earth. Amen. Amen. Wow. Amen. Someone said, uh, you know, my telecast hit 87 million households last Sunday. Wow. So when you hit that many people, you get a lot of questions. You also get a lot of other stuff. <laughs> but that's just food for my shredder. I learned from my old buddy Ollie North, Oliver North, just shred it. Don't even worry about it. Sometimes I shred it, put it in an envelope, and mail it back, said return to sender. That's how important it seems to be, you know. But so I got to ask this question. Now, Dr. Barkley, you said that the Lord's coming, and uh, is there like one coming or two comings or what's going on? I said, no, there's only one second coming. <coughs> Excuse me. It, it happens at the end of the tribulation period. But we're not talking about the second coming right now. We're talking about the last appearance. When Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples, different ones in different places. The coolest visit, I think, is when he went in the upper room. And it was locked down, man. And he went right through the wall. Yes, <laughs> Knuckles, yes, you know we're going to do yes, that someday, right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Maybe I can't dance, but I'm going to go through walls. Just let me tell you right now. Amen. And then he ate. He, he said, what do you have to eat here? And they said, fish. And he ate the fish and went back out through the wall. What happened to that fish? No, he appeared. And he's going to appear one more time. But he doesn't touch down, according to the scriptures. We see him in the sky. Good reason to look up. You know, Jesus said, 
don't let my coming catch you like a thief in the night. Yes, well, right. he's not a thief. No. And we, have no, we don't know if he's coming in the hours of darkness or not. Amen. Night. That's not what he was saying. Right. He was saying, if you knew the thief was down the road, four houses from yours, and you saw him coming your way, you wouldn't unlock the door, open the window. Hey, you talk about jewelry, man. Come in here. I got some fine earrings. You kidding me, man? You'd lock it down tight. Yes, sir. Get a stick or something if you don't have a gun. This is Alabama. You probably got a gun. <laughs> or two. I'm from Michigan. We got four to six in our households. So Jesus was saying, if you don't let this event of the last appearance catch you off guard. Like a thief roaming the neighborhood at night. You know I'm coming, Jesus said. Here's the signs of it. So make sure you're ready for when I appear in the sky. It says, you know, we'll be caught up. He doesn't come down. We'll be caught up and we'll ever be with him. Man. I like, I'm, I'm waiting. I want, I'm doing rapture practice in my hotel room. Come on, man. I'm out of here. You can say, I know some people don't believe in this. They believe in the rupture. You stick around and tell us how it was if you make heaven. I'm going on the first elevator out of here. That's where I'm headed. I'm out of here. But the second coming now, that happens at the end of the tribulation period, the climax the ages where it says Jesus puts his foot on the Mount of Olives right. and he goes to war and he takes care of all the rebel nations that were still confronting his people. I got something to tell you. You shouldn't be here for that event. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Someone said, what will it be like once the church is off the planet? Oh, man. Take what's going on. I, I can paint a picture for you. Take what's going on in the Ukraine. Take what goes on in the, in the little 10, 11, 12-year-old sex slave trafficking that goes on. Take what's going on over in the Middle East where you either deny Jesus, they take your head off, or you can, whatever you can get in a backpack, get it and run for your life. There's plenty of pictures all over this planet. And that's with the church here resisting the Antichrist. What happens when the church is gone? Oh, man, it's going to be torment. And you know what? They're going to find you. You know how I know they're going to find you? Because somebody you know knows you and knows you're a Christian. And that doesn't mean they're a Christian. And they may not go when the trumpet blows. And, the, and if you're still here... Uh, they'll say, we happen to know that girl's a Christian. Uh -oh. Now, I see it. You can go get my whole study on it if you want to. But, you know, you're going to have one or two choices if you miss the catching away. One, just run out in the street and yell, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. They will find you. They will torture you. They'll probably torture your family in front of you. Rape them, dismember them, because that's how evil and dirty. Just look around right now. You, don't, you can't. I mean, 35 years ago, you got to paint a picture like, oh, man. Now it's all over the news. I mean, you, you, think, you think what humans are doing to humans is human? Yeah. It's the day we live in. And when the church is gone, the number one resistor. Oh, oh, so they'll find you. They're going to kill you. They're going to torture you probably. But you'll make heaven. But what if you decide that Jesus knows your heart and it doesn't matter what you say? And you deny Jesus. I have a word for you. They're still going to torture you. They're still going to kill you. But now you're going to go to hell because you've denounced Jesus Christ and you've sworn your obeisance over to the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. Someone said, Doc, do you think we're going to take the mark of the beast? I said, where would you put it? <laughs> the mark of the Christ is all over your forehead. Oh, Our hands are oh, the mark of the Christ. Oh, you, I mean, you would, to take the mark of the beast, which I don't biblically see that happening while we're still here on the planet, but nonetheless, we're sure having some forerunner activity, aren't we? 
You don't wear a mask. You don't buy, sell, or trade. You don't get a vaccine. You don't buy, sell, or trade. We're, it's all getting set up for the Antichrist. But you should look happy because unless you're a cheater and you don't know Jesus, you won't be here for this. Amen. We'll be out of here, man. Amen. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Yeah. You know, how do you know that, Doc? The Bible. I believe the Bible because out of any book ever written by man anywhere, nothing's been more dissected, challenged, investigated, interrogated and proven to be right scientifically, archaeologically, historically, r religiously, no book on this planet has ever been challenged so greatly and keeps coming out on top. And, and lo and behold, isn't it something? People say, well, the Bible said that was going to happen. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and, it's gonna, and it's been that way, and it's just going to be that way. That's why I believe the Lord is really talking to preachers and pastors. Get this Bible back out and make sure we understand. There may be some differences even. Like I got some preacher friends. They don't quite believe my eschatology. They, they call it mid-trib. That they're going to go in the middle of the tribulation. Okay. Some say, not okay for me. Some say, well, we're going to go through the whole tribulation period. And I said, Wow. One young man told me that. Dr. Barclay, I don't want to, you're my pastor, I love you, I don't want to disagree with you, but I think we're going to go through the tribulation period. I said, wait, 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 you're going to go through the tribulation period? He goes, yeah. I said, I'll give you one day. One day. Then I thought about it. I said, I can't give you that much because you can't even beat the little imp demons that keep you out of church, stop you from forgiving. You still steal the tithe. You post all this ugly junk on the, on the anti-social D Facebook Tweety Bopper sites. And, and you think you're going to beat the demons of the tribulation period? I said, I changed my mind. I'll give you one hour. Now, if you truly plan to go through the tribulation, you better fire up your furnace like you never fired and get your act together like you never had it together before. Because, again, if we can't beat these demons... These are second grade level demons. These are Cub Scouts. But when the church is gone, or if you believe you're going to be here, the tribulation period is a no joke matter. And you know what I, you know what I learned? There are seven vials that will be broke open and poured upon the earth. For seven years. Here's what I discovered. None of them are opened in hell. Demons deliver none of them. It's the wrath of God. They're all opened in heaven. And angels deliver them to whatever's left in the earth. And someone says, well, God's not mad at you. Oh, 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 oh. Whoa. Uh, you'd be nothing but a blown up pimple if God wasn't making sure that Jesus held you for the final moments. Amen. We're protected in Him. But what if you're not in Him? Amen. So what will overcome this? Well, what over, you know, one of the gods of America is philosophy. A lot of our, I hate to say younger, because I'm not against younger preachers. We produce younger preachers. But it seems to hit mostly the younger preachers. Uh, a, a, a lot of younger preachers, they're motivational speakers or philosophers. They hardly deal with this book. You know, in fact, some of them have told us not to read this book. That it's not for today or don't read the red letters. Yeah, there's living proof. For it. I'm not just being critical. And uh, so they believe in philosophy. All philosophy is, is man's idea of how this should work on the earth. Then we got to go to psychology. All psychology is, is the same people saying, we got to figure out why you have that philosophy. We got to, we got to examine your id. We got to get in your ego and super ego. I mean, you believe this? Why would you believe this? It's like, it's like a college professor in my town challenged some of the young people in his class at the college university about creation. So, uh, 
he finally asked to talk to me because if you raise up kids right, they don't just submit and say, oh, okay, I guess my church, my pastor, my parents, the Bible has told me wrong all these years and you're the professor and if you say it's wrong, then I'm just going to swap over. There are a lot of young people like that, but not if you raise them biblically right. So these young people, they were respectful, but they were, they were getting D minuses and E's and F's on their, on their report because they were disagreeing with the professor. But he, but, but he said, now all you got to do is this, this, and that, and I'll up your grade. And they said, we're not compromising to approve you. We, we, we live to be approved by God. So he got so frustrated, he wanted to talk to me. I said, bring it on. <laughs> I look for challenges like this. So he says, this creation thing, he almost made a, a face like, you know, when someone burnt toast in the house, you know, you... He almost, he made a face when he said it. I said, just stop a minute. Let me, let me ask you a question. If you don't believe in the creation, then you must believe that my grandmother or great-grandmother or great-great-grandmother was a polywog that turned into an ape. Maybe I should take you to her and see how well it will go over if you tell her her mother was an ape. I said, I have a feeling if you believe that phony baloney, you must believe in the leprechauns and a four-leaf clover and Santa Claus or a bunny laying eggs. <laughs> he got up from the table. He goes, touche, preacher, and walked out the door. <laughs> That's like 10 years ago. I've never had a problem yet. Never has one of my young people come back from that college and said, that, that professor challenged us on creation. I said, of course not. He, that, he's just doing what he's been taught to do to fit into his little environment. Right. He's not used to being challenged, which is a major, major problem. So you, don't ha you know this, right? You don't have to overcome this world. You can submit. You can succumb. You can be one of their robots. Sure you can. Many people do, even Christians. Yeah, you don't have to. But if you want to and not become a slave to Antichrist or Antichrist ways or the practice runs, you're going to have to have faith. That's why, we're, that's why your pastors teach you like they do. That's why we're having this faith-type conference to remind us this is what brings the victory. Even our faith. Which means, technically it means trusting God. When Jesus said, one day he said, when the Son of Man comes back, that's him, will he find faith in the earth? You know what he was asking? Will there, will there still be anybody left here that will still trust me? Faith in God means you trust God. Everything in our life is being designed to pull away our trust, our trust in church, our trust in the Bible, our trust in our man or woman of God. Are you listening to me? Amen. Is that why you're so quiet? Or you, 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 don't, you haven't had it with me already, have you? I know Alan Bailey teaches longer than this right here. <laughs> let alone the apostle. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, do you preach what? 30 minutes? Yeah, about, that? Yeah. about 45? About 45? 45. 50. I, I gave you 50. 55. I'll give you 60. It. I'll take it. Yes. <laughs> I'm stopping there because I don't want to lead you into lying when I'm your dad. <laughs> We're just having fun for a minute because you all look so serious. But then again, these are pretty serious matters, aren't they? Amen. Do you know how to get faith? No? You can't get any faith by reading. By hearing. Your eye has never been given permission to extract faith from the scriptures. Information, knowledge, wisdom, inspiration. But find me a verse that says, faith comes by seeing and reading. Reading the word of God. It's not there. Faith comes by hearing. There must be a reason for this. Why was my ear given heavenly permission to supernaturally, because it's a supernatural event, to extract faith from the Bible being preached when my eye wasn't. It must be. See, you can read at home, but it's hard to hear your preacher at home. 
unless you want to cheat with modern technology. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they've been Oh. So there must be some preachers that God didn't send. That you can listen to them all day and get all kinds of information, have a good joke, comedy, have some fun. I don't know. But will faith be delivered? Well, in other words, will it build your trust in God? Or will it build your trust in man? I have no problems with a preacher being rich or famous or popular if they really are and they're not just faking it. I don't have a problem with that. I don't want to, that's not what my goal is, but I don't have a problem if, if they do. But let me tell you what I do have a problem with. Those same type of preacher who they have almost taken the place of Christ in the church. And it's all about them. And it's all about, you know, you do what they say. Whether, whether they read the Bible or not, or many of them have now turned from the Scriptures, either part way or all way, and the massive people of groups still follow them. When the Son of Man comes, will there still be people on the earth that trust Him? That He's telling the truth of how this would come down. Now, this is something to think about. If faith comes by hearing, and it does, and hearing the Word of God, not poetry, not history, not philosophy, not psychology, not business techniques, not business maneuvers. If that's how faith comes, and it'll only come through a preacher, you could prove that, Book of Romans, for example. How will they preach and bring us more trust in God if God never sent them and their wolves in sheep's clothing or hirelings? No matter how rich and how famous they are. So masses of people, I hope you're not one of them, masses of people could be listening to all these modern voices and, and it weakens their faith. It starts to water down their trust in God. But what if you listen to a man or woman of God that refuses to lay down the Bible? What about that? Then when you hear, and what, what if they really are sent by God to pastor you? Yeah. Now faith comes. Or if you prefer, now you trust God again because they refresh your mind with the Bible and the, and the supernatural event. That's right. That's the Bible. We're going to be okay, praise God. Now we're going to be okay. Don't worry. Be happy. We're going to be okay because the God said, our God said, if you do the following things, you're going to be all right. Hallelujah. Yeah. It's that simple. It's talking about overcomers. There's a verse that says, for those who endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Those that endure, how do you endure? You keep overcoming. How do you keep overcoming? You keep coming to get faith, which is the element that helps you overcome the world. Less preaching from a preacher that's sent to your life to help you the less faith. The less faith, the less overcoming. Amen. That means you're going to lose more battles until you begin to wonder, tithing doesn't work. I tithe. Uh, where's my floodgate? Church attendance, been there, done that. It was okay, but it didn't really do anything. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and we never got a miracle. See what's happening? The lack of faith yes. Is, yes. is causing you to stop trusting your God that he's got this in the palm of his hand. So, wait a minute, hang on, I, man, I'm lightning quick-minded, man, here, I was educated in Michigan, you know Michigan, don't you? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, why did you look like that when I said that? <laughs> you trying to pick a fight? No, sir. <laughs> I'm rising. <you. laughs> I tried to keep a straight face and I couldn't do it. So... Wait a minute, in my lightning fast mind, if the Bible says, he that overcometh shall be saved, what about he who didn't? Now overcome means there was an obstacle. There was an opponent. 
there was an enemy, there was a battle, there was a conflict, and you didn't surrender, and you finally overcame the thing. I don't know if you're talking about substance abuse, strife, unforgiveness, envy, sickness in your body. I mean, there's a, there's a thousand enemies, but this, but the Bible's clear. If you overcome, you'll be saved. What if, what if, what if you don't? See, we have a little teaching I think we need to upgrade. Many people think that because they prayed a two-paragraph sinner prayer and they became born again, that that's the same as saved. If that's the same as saved, then what does this verse mean I'm quoting? And what about the verse that says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? What do I got to do that for? If I just pray a two-paragraph sinner's prayer, and then it doesn't matter, you know, hey, thanks, Reverend, let's go get a beer. Like nothing needs to change. There's something missing. And I'm not putting down the sinner's prayer or that people should get born again. But what are we going to do with verses like this? On that day, Jesus said, there would be those who say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Didn't we do mighty works? I guess that means big buildings and big this and big. Didn't we do mighty works? And didn't we even work at exercising demons right. in your name? Right. Do you know the Bible? What did Jesus say to them? Depart from me. You know how we say that? Get out of my sight. Yes, sir. Amen. And then he said, he didn't say, hey, I don't know if I know you. He said, I never knew you. Yeah. What? They're using the name of Jesus, man. I never knew you. This reminds me. I was in my second career carrying bags for Vicki, my wife, while she shops. I have many years of experience in this ministry. And one day, she was trying on a dress. Now, you don't do that out where the dresses are. You go in the women's dressing room. But if your wife wants to show you what it looks like, she doesn't want you in the men's department. She wants you to hang around the women's department. And one, no, I'm not talking right. <laughs> Why? Wait a minute. Side note. Why do women always stick together? I'm not even done with the story yet. And you're on Vicky's side. So, she says, I'm going to try this on, see what you think about it. Yes, now, you can't win that battle. You can't win that. I've tried, I'm, I've been married 52 years. You can't win that battle. I'm just telling you. So, she comes out. How does it look? Now, I either got to lie or I got to smooth the truth. I'll say, oh, praise God. Get it. Let's go. Oh, you don't like it. I didn't say that. Well, I can tell you don't like it. What is it? What, what, what's wrong with it? Vicki, buy it. Buy two of them, one of each color. Let's go. No, no, no. I'm not buying it if you don't like it. <laughs> what are you supposed to say? Honey, you look fat in that dress. Baby. <laughs> no, don't do that, right, Apostle? Don't do that. Don't do that. I, I figured that out the really hard way. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Right? So I'm in, a, I'm in the ladies' department. And I'm patiently waiting. I got bags, you know, and she's in trying something. And this girl, little girl comes by, and she stops right here and looks up at me. And her little lips quiver. And she goes, you're a man. <laughs> I felt like saying, stick with that girl. Don't let the teacher teach you different. <laughs> at least you know the difference. I didn't say that, but I did think it. You're a man. I said, it's okay, honey. My wife is in there, and I'm waiting for her to try on a dress. She just mm, walked away. <laughs> and Vicki came out, and she said, honey, what do you think? Come closer. Oh, no. No, 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 no. I'm not getting any closer to the women's dressing room. I'm sorry. Well, tell me what you think. I said, We'll teach you guys something right here. You're beautiful. Don't bring up the dress. 
you're beautiful, let's go. And all of a sudden, I heard these, there was a, there's three ladies, and I, it was like they practiced it. Mark T. Barclay, preacher of righteousness. They heard my voice. And here they come around the dress section, and, there's, and they said, Brother Barclay. I said, I know, I know, I'm in the ladies' department, but Vicky's right there trying something out. Wow. And they, they, they how, is, how is Vicky? I said, well, she'll be out in a minute. How's your son Josh? Oh, he, he, he's, he's doing pretty good. And your daughter Dawn? It's like, she's doing pretty good. I'm thinking, I don't know these people. I just don't know them. And they know everything about me. You know? And finally, uh, finally I said, ladies, I, I feel bad, but uh, I don't recognize you. Do, I, do I know you? Do, do we know you? And uh, Vicky came up then. I said, Vicky, these ladies know us. Uh, you know, do, we, do, we, do you know them? No. And one of them spoke up and said, Brother Barclay, you know us. We watch you on TV all the time. <laughs> and heard all my stories. And the minute they said that, I stood there and the Lord said, See? On that final day, there are those who swear they know me, but I don't know them. Just like these women knew you, or really knew about you, but you don't know anything about them. Amen. And man, when that hit me, Alan, I thought, whoa. I'm going to get working on Mark Barclay right now. Amen. Think about this, because it's the day we live in. Yes, sir. It is. We're in the final moments of human history, or at least church history, probably church history. Because, you know, uh, if you study the Bible good, you know nothing has to happen between this second right here and the catching away of the church. There's not one thing that needs to be fulfilled that I can find biblically that, that could happen between right now and the catching away of the church. It could happen before we're done with this meeting. It could happen tonight, tomorrow, a week from now. I, I, I don't know. Nobody knows that time. But there's no event scheduled. Now, now, before the second coming and before the tribulation period and before World War III, which it looks like we're igniting right now, before Armageddon, there, you know, before the end of the age, there's some things that are going to take place yet that we haven't witnessed yet that's predicted to happen, but not the catching away of the church. Come, Lord Jesus. But what stops you me from being taken in by the world's ways, the philosophies, the forced teaching, the temptation, the indoctrination. Think about, I'll ask it to you this way. Does anybody know how to unscramble an egg? That egg before it was scrambled looked like every other egg. You can't unscramble it. So as we go through time, how do we redo all the things we're being taught? Even like you just came through COVID, right? That's right. Do you think that was just a disease? It was a disease. In fact, it's still hurting people today. Not like it was. It's a killer problem. Whether it's man enhanced, man released biological warfare or a real virus or whatever it was. Some of us actually know, but so however, why ever, it, it hurt people, it killed people, and it is still hurting some people. But that doesn't seem to be what took over America. It was the demon that came with it. In the United States of America, at least in the state where I live, you were a prisoner to your house or else. And one person made the decision, called a governor. And the governor said, you can't leave your house, period. You can't even garden in your backyard, period. You can go to the store, but you can only go to the store that I, the governor, select. And when you're in the store, you can only buy what you're told to buy. That's right. Wow. That's, right. That's what happened. Yes, it did. You could go in and say Walmart. You probably know that here, that name. Uh, that's not, it wasn't Walmart, it was the governor. 
You could go into, say, like Walmart, and once you get through the door, you know, your hands washed and the temperature and the mask and, and get your approval. And at first, you had to, in my state, you had to sign in and sign out of the store. And so you go in. And when you went in the store, Reginald, yes, they had rows and rows police taped off. So you could only buy in that store what the governor said you could buy. Wow. And it was worse than that. Wow. And so, one of my friends, I'm only going to say this just to differentiate. One of my friends is African American. Yes. And so, he calls our governor, I guess, and our mayor, and said, I have a, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, the, my, the history of my bloodline is slavery. Mm -hmm. When you tell a black man he can't leave his house without permission from the white woman. Yeah. You can go to the store, but only where I tell you. You can only stay in the store so many minutes. Mm -hmm. You can only buy in that store what you're told to buy. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Yeah. So you can't keep your job. You'll stay home. So you can't feed your babies. You can't take care of your bride. Mm -hmm. So he had a good argument. You whites, I don't know what you call that, but we blacks call that slavery. That's right. They were dead on the money, right? Yeah, yeah. And I sat back and thought, in the United States of America? Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And then all the indoctrination of what they call free speech. Come on. Yeah. Did you see the interview, maybe? They interviewed like, gosh, I can't remember, like a uh, like hundred and, I think it was maybe, I'm going to just throw the number. I might be a little wrong. 125 postgraduates from the greatest universities in America. All different, you know, colors of skin, all different roots, all different male, female. And they were asking them, can you define freedom of speech according to the Constitution? Almost every single one of them said, you can't say anything to me I don't approve of and I don't like. Wow. These are college-educated, master and doctor degree wow. people in the United States of America. And the interviewer said, can you tell me any freedom then that I have to speak? Because mm -hmm. see, we're told not to profile. Right. That's right. You can't profile people. That's right. But if I have to be politically correct, That's right. then how do I do that without profiling you first? Right. Are you a woman or do you think you're one? Right. Are you a man or do you just feel like that today? What color of your skin? What's your roots? Are you rich? Are you poor? Are you old? Are you young? What kind of car are you driving? Did your boost cost, you know, 5000 or 50 bucks? How do I know how to answer you that's pleasing to you if I don't profile you first so that I can answer you and not get in any trouble? Amen. This is why they hated Donald Trump more than anything because he made Swiss cheese out of their version of uh, freedom of speech. And as crude as he was, I think he did some of it on purpose. <laughs> no. I know you know that if you're a Democrat, but any Republicans in here believe that as well? I'm not being political. I'm, just, I'm back to my point. All of this has been going on. All this reset, all this reteaching, all this twisting of the Constitution. Even preachers twisting the scriptures. This is, a, this is all meant to reteach us, reteach us, reteach us, reteach us. Don't trust, if you notice this, don't trust in anything that's founded. Let's redefine marriage. It's only worked for 6,000 years, but let's redefine it now. Right? Let's redefine child parent authority. Let's redefine. Let's redefine. Let's redefine. Let's have a global reset. Now, here's a danger for you and me. I don't think you're going to go for that reset thing. I'm just saying, the danger for you and me is that if you listen to more of that and less of this, listen, I said. If you listen to more of that, the news, the broadcast, the internet, even some of the modern, I call them modernist preachers, they're going to change your mind. Let me rephrase that. That wasn't fair. You're going to have the tendency to change your mind and get you thinking 
Now, wait a minute. Is that what you really believe? Is that what we believe? Or do we believe what they're saying? Because they all come off like they are the absolute experts. But you know what they really are? Prophets of the land. Remember the prophet of God and the prophets of the land and Ahab? Quick story. Ahab was married to Jezebel. Yay. So Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, calls Ahab, the king of Israel, and says, I don't think you can take Ramoth Gilead, and I don't think I can, but if we join forces between both our armies, we can go down, take Ramoth Gilead, beat their military, and we'll split all the spoils of war. So Jehoshaphat says, well, Ahab, let's first inquire what the word of the Lord is for today. Pause on that. What if our young people did this before they got married? What if, they, what if they say, you're a hot hunk and I want you, but I'm going to wait and see what God says. Let's go talk to God first. Or, or business deals. Or whatever. And so, Jehoshaphat, he says, well, let's, let's inquire what the word of the Lord is. So Ahab yes, called 400 prophets of the land, the Bible says. Now, you've got to be famous to get called to the white I mean the palace. You got to be famous. And so they all come and they all prophesied, you're going to win. Don't worry about it. Go to war. It'll be easy. They are all in agreement. Now that's quite a service. 400 of them. So that's either one prophecy with 309 confirmations or 400 of them had something to say. That wasn't a quick meeting. When it's all said and done, Jehoshaphat says, Ahab, Barclay version, good show. Then he says this, but is there not a prophet of God in this region? Amen. Yes, sir. You know what Ahab said, right? Well, there's one, but he never prophesies anything good about me. So he was never invited to the party. That's in your Bible. So, you, we just came through two years of people prophesying things that they swore to God. God told them it didn't come to pass. Amen. Amen. Then we turn on the news. And you know what they're doing on the news? They get all these people, and you know, from different locations. I'm not cutting the news, by the way. They get their people. And you know, almost, they're never really asked anything but to predict. But that's the prophet's job. Well, um, how do you see this? Coming out, you're a great military commander. In other words, prophesy. Mm -hmm. Well, you used to work for Reagan in economics. How do you think this money's going to turn out? What are they asking them? Prophesy. Mm -hmm. Foretell the future. Where is this going? And a mass of people who even walk with God are listening to these prophets of the land right. instead of the prophets of God. Mm -hmm. And worse yet, instead of that book. Amen. That book defines it pretty good. Yes. Can I have an amen on it? Amen. So, to wrap this up and pray over you for a minute, here we are. We're, this is it. We need to come to grips with this. This isn't a passing thing. No. Okay. So we got over the COVID thing. It looks like. I mean, it almost looks like, according to the TV, it's gone away. That's right. I haven't even seen Fauci in a while. He, he, he either ran away from home, got arrested, he's in hiding or something, I don't know. That's all you heard of for a long time, is my point. And so, wow, all of a sudden it's gone. Why? We have a war. We have a war going on. So no, you can't turn on any news without real live pictures. And then, lo and behold, we have a fuel crisis. Really? Yes, there's a shortage of oil. No. The United States alone is reporting that they got enough underground fuel to fuel us for 1,000 years, excuse me, 2,000 years, and fuel the whole world for 1,000 years. There's no shortage on oil. That's only one country. Canada's begging everybody to buy their oil they got so much. 
there's no shortage on oil, like what we're being told, then why would we be being told that? Uh, a year and a half ago, we were supplying oil for everybody. Do you remember the gas price then? It wasn't four to eight bucks a gallon. Okay, wait, hang on a second. So why did COVID crisis disappear and oil crisis came? Because they wore out COVID and even Americans were becoming very intolerant and even telling their draconian and, and, and tyrant leadership, we're not doing this anymore. You do it, we're not doing it. That's what's happening in America. So now we have a fuel problem, Apostle. We have a fuel problem. So you know the, the uh, International uh, Energy Agency, International Energy Agency, put out their 10 points of what they're suggesting all nations do to help get over the oil shortage crisis. One of them, one of those points is stop all vehicles from operating on Sunday. Go read it for yourself. Go read that for yourself. That's their, I'm not, I'm not, it's not conspiracy. They, they posted that. They're the biggest advisors to the energy in, on the globe. And that was definitely one of their points. Let's stop all traffic. Shut down all vehicles on Sunday. Why not Saturday? Why not Friday night to Saturday night? Why Sunday? The if you need me to interpret that, I'm leaving here and going home. No, it's on purpose. Now, it's not a conspiracy theory. Go look it up for yourself. Oh, by the way, the other organization, that the environmentalist, they just put out their report, same last week. And uh, they put out their 10 points of how to save planet Earth. Now, I don't know, anybody here have been to China or Southeast Asia or Brazil? So you know when you land the airplane there, your eyes burn, your nose runs, because the smog is so bad. And they're doing nothing in these countries to clean it up. Only we are. But I don't think they've learned this word, wind. So you might remember when there was an earthquake in Japan years ago, not that many years ago, and it caused a tsunami and it cracked the nuclear energy plants in Japan and it released nuclear fallout. And seven to ten days later, our meters were picking it up on the coast of the state of Washington. The wind blew it there in about ten days. So I know, I know, let's save Earth. Let's all of us do the big green thing because no one else is. So let's do it, and they can live any way they want to, and we'll be controlled by our government under restrictions that you can't even buy a car without the right kind of muffler on it. Y'all looking like, well, Pastor Allen, what did you put in this guy's iced tea before he came out here? I don't mean to sound so negative, but we live in a negative time. And, and now here, here, here it is. If you want to overcome it, you don't have to. You can submit and obey. That's right. You can be the pawn. You can, you can believe everything they're telling you. You know, I mean, if, if you believe, for example, CDC, if you believe them, uh, you might be part gone. I mean, they change their numbers all the time. This is the Center for Disease Control. We all trusted them with our life. And through this whole last couple of years, they, they got bogus numbers. Their, their own evaluation numbers are actually scary of their own self and their inner, you know, audits. But, but so you could, you and I, we could just submit and believe everything they tell you. And let's save the planet. Let's prepare even the church for the Antichrist because all the other preachers are just like Noah. They're just exaggerating. There really isn't any judgment coming. You can do that. And some Christians are. It may be what triggers the great apostasy, the great falling away just before the Lord comes. Not trusting God and trusting other people instead. 
Personally, I'm going to keep hearing those who are called by God preach and faith is going to keep coming into my life and my family and we're going to overcome, 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 overcome. That's what we're going to do. And I pray you do the same thing. Amen. Well, I don't know if I helped you, scared you, stirred you up, you totally disagreed with me or something, but uh, you got to remember, guys, gals, Satan's coming. He's walking the earth, not coming like he's on the earth. Satan's coming. The Bible says he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may desire. Not who he wills to desire. Because he wills to desire all of us. Do you know the term a roaring lion? You, are, you, you know this term if you're a combat trained individual. You'll know this term if you're a big safari hunter or a safari photo taker. The term roaring lion belongs to an old lion in the jungle who is now too old. He's not strong enough. His teeth aren't strong enough to fight and be the king of the jungle. So it is built into this lion to make a louder roar that roars through the jungle to make his point. And uh, the regular prey doesn't know he's old and toothless. Or, all, or can't bite like he did. He amplifies his roar. He amplifies his roar to make his point that I'm still the king of the jungle, though he's not. That's what is happening to you and me. All this loud noise, it seems to be so true, but there's no bite in it unless you just submit and you quiver and you hide and you gear your life, business, and ministry, and family according to what they're saying because the threat is there. Wow. Or, we just keep hearing the word preached. Now, if faith comes by hearing, and it does, and, and hearing from the word of God, and it does, and it comes from the preacher who's been sent by God, how will they hear without a preacher? So it's got to be a preacher. How do they preach unless they are sent? So it can't be just any preacher. Then I wonder why so many people are staying home. Because if they stay home and read, or they even listen to some preachers that are not sent by God, they then trust and courage does not come. Mm -hmm. So they get weaker yeah. and weaker. And then they say, I don't know what's going on. Man, I love Jesus. I go to church when I can. I don't normally steal the tithe. I try to present it when I can. I'm trying to forgive everybody. I like to shoot two and choke one. But you know, uh, they, and what's happening? They're slowly losing track of their trust in God. And eventually... Man's built to take matters in his own hands. I'm preaching again. It must be your anointing, your forerunner anointing. How long does Pastor Allen preach? Half hour? You never know? It's never boring, though. It's never boring? You better, he knows who you are. You better clean it up really quick, sister. Father, I thank you for the word of God. There's never been a time, Jesus, that we've needed the Bible more than right now today. To hear it preached, to trust it, to listen. Not only to get the information and have our minds washed from the pollutants and the contaminants of all this philosophy and psychology and satanic doctrines of demons, but to build our faith up to become overcomers. Oh, how we thank you for it. How we thank you for it. How we thank you for it. You for it. Yes. Pastor Allen, bring your, right you? Yes. Allen, bring your family right here in front of me, would you? I'm going to anoint this family with oil. I had it in my heart flying in here today. Father, I thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You all are finding out that what you're trying to do is very difficult. I could name names right now, some of the most famous preachers 
that I've known in my lifetime that tried to do ministry together as a family and totally failed. Dozens of them. So just to start with, what you're trying to do to be together, go to church together, work in the ministry together. Satan hates this. Satan hates this. And now you're doing the bakery. If Satan hates anything, close to ministry is business because it's all meant to supply. It's all meant to put you ahead. It's all meant to make money. And the devil hates it. So the devil's going to do anything he can to bust you up, to get you to not work together, not stay together, and bring so much whatever. Every family's different. I know this because my family sticks together. And we do ministry together globally. And uh, my kids do. My grandkids do. You know, my great-grandkids will if the Lord tarries. And it's not, it's not an easy fight. It's a very difficult it goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. So it can, not, it can be a sibling thing. It can be so much pressure on the headship of the family that things begin to be stretched too far. You only stretch your rubber band so far and it snaps. And I don't know of anybody that really has tried to repair a rubber band when it snaps. So I felt impressed of God flying in here to anoint you with oil for the anointing to deal with family and ministry. And the bakery, of course, you're in business. Yes, sir. And uh, you remember what I told you about that? I do. Okay. And so we're going to anoint you now. Would the rest of the church raise a hand up here? Uh, Father, I thank you. I put this anointing all, and I lay my hands on Reverend Alan Bailey, called to preach this gospel, called to set men free, called by you, Lord, to make a difference in people's lives. And for somehow to build an army here that will go, that will stay, that will reach out, that will be here when people reach in, I anoint him for it. And I say that he is going to see through every veil and canopy, every camouflage and cloud that Satan sets out there in front of him and his family. They're going to see it, they're going to know it, and they're going to break that thing. And they're going to be able to work together and stick together and flow together. In the name of Jesus, a fresh grace and a fresh anointing on you as the first lady of this house, the mom and grandma of this family, the big sister among other preacher's wives, and sometimes even a mom. I anoint you for it with the oil of God by the laying on of hands. I say over you, that 2022 now is going to turn into an easier year, a year of less uh, opposition, a year of less fog. I command this cloud of fog to lift off your family, to lift off from this church. Uh, not an evil cloud, just a cloud that you always got to sort stuff out and see through. I anoint you to deal with that by the anointing of God. And I thank you now, Father, for each family member in the name of Jesus. May they stand strong, do the work of God. I anoint you for it with the anointing oil of God. To break every yoke, to enjoy your life. Satan will try to steal all the joy of living. He'll, he'll try to make it all just hard warfare, hard stuff, disagreement, you know, thickness. But I anoint you to live. I anoint you to live good and, and free in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord. 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 Let's pray in the Holy Ghost. Do it. Come on, everybody. Let's pray in the Spirit. So ba do la mosten kin do le moshaka leva se la mando la moshakeshe leva le vondo li amaz en gain do la boste Reginald, is your whole family here or not? It is. So I might as well. You want me to do it in the morning or anoint them now? Do it right now. Okay. Let's pray for these first, Father. I thank you now. We bind every hindering spirit that's coming against this church just like the devil so dumb he wars against all churches we bind that evil spirit we thank you for the peace of god everybody say peace, peace. we thank you for the joy of god everybody say joy. joy and in the name of jesus christ of nazareth i thank you my master better times stronger times more money more anointing and more fun to live 
and to walk out these, this gospel. In the name of Jesus, give them all a good hand clap. Come on. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Reginald, all, call your family up. Amen, guys. Hallelujah. Thank God for you. I say the same thing over you. What you're trying to do is a very difficult task. It can be done. I know many that couldn't do it. I know many that failed at it. But I also know there are those who have done it. My family's done it now for uh, 40, well, 42 years. I've been in the ministry longer than that, but, you know, as far as family goes, praise God. Amen. And so, Father, I thank you for what they, you called them to do it. It's not like we're making it up or we're wishing it would work. We've been called to do this. There really is no choice about it. And when you try to make it a choice, it just gets rougher and rougher, harder and harder. So I anoint you with oil. I thank you, Lord, the father of this family, the father of his ministries, the pastor of that church, grandpa. I anoint him to lead and feed this family and to keep it strong and keep it on course. La basola badola mashtan gandola boshi kele masatalamanda. I anoint you in the name of Jesus to walk all through this, to be strong in it, to be anointed for it, to see through it, and to take charge of this family under your man, the holy man, and the church family, and to and to, and to be you. And don't let anybody shut you up again corner you again you mother the flock of God and you lead as I've anointed you to do it I anoint you for your babies and I anoint you for your grandbabies and the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth I thank you master I thank you I anoint you in Jesus name and you and your babies in the name of Jesus I thank you, Master. To do all that you've been called to do, to work as a family, to work as a team, and to see your dreams come true. This is going to be a good year for you right here. Your dreams are going to come true. And I see these couple of things that you're almost begging God for. They're about to manifest in your life. They're about to manifest in your life. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And just like I did the Bailey family, I speak peace over us. I speak anointing over us. And I say none of this is going to ever rob our joy. We're going to live in prosperity and obey our God as a family. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. Well, clap for this family. I love you. You know that. You know that. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, Alan. Praise God. Woo! Glory. Amen. Well, have you enjoyed yourself tonight? Uh, uh, yeah. 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 So if you would just stand to your feet with me real quick. Um, we're, I, want, I want to talk to you just a minute about a couple things, but, but it just there, there's an anointing in this room, and, and I just want to say uh, under this anointing, just, just bow your heads with me. Father, thank you for a preacher of righteousness, and thank you for a man of God who will, who will teach truth in a season where truth seems to be becoming very invisible. And Lord, I pray what is taught in this room tonight that we let it sink down deep into our heart, the good ground of our heart, that it yields fruit, not a fruit of fear or of the times, but of knowing that by faith we overcome and that our eyes are stayed upon you and that perfect peace is always ours. And God, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of things before we go tonight. We're going to receive an offering. So as you're getting ready for that, ushers, if you'll get ready, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity uh, to sow. But as, as you get ready for that tonight, there is a product table out in the foyer. And I want you to take a look at uh, everything that's out there. It's the teaching that, that changed my life, changed your life. And uh, a quick story, uh, I saw... Uh, the first time we ever went to the KCM Ministers Conference was the first time we ever saw you on stage. 
And I think the second year uh, was when I looked to you and I said, now that's a preacher. You remember that? And, and I'd read several books, honestly, just a few books and didn't really know. And took, for all of these years, almost 18 years later now, right around the time we connected, to, to have you here and to preach a message like that in the season where we need it. I say thank you. I say thank you. I appreciate that. Now, now y'all, y'all all know me. I got jokes, but I know when to be serious. And what we got tonight was challenging. And, uh, but in a very, very good way. Amen. And, and especially for those of us that are ministers in the house, of course, you're all ministers, whether you know it or not. Uh, but for the ministers, that I take this as a personal challenge to grow and to go deeper and to be ready to encourage those around us in the season that's ahead. Because we win. Because we've already won. Amen. Amen. God's good. All right, real quick, we're going to... Uh, if you'll pull up Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesiastes 11 and 1 on the screen, I want you guys to read what we used last night, and, and the Lord's prompted me to talk about it again. You've all read this scripture before, and uh, are you ready? There it is. Go ahead. You can put it up to it. There you go. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. And somebody that grew up on the beach, I remember throwing things in the ocean and watching it just roll out and roll back in and roll out and roll back. And sometimes it would even go down. But you would always see it rolling out and rolling back in. And my entire life has been built on sowing on every wave and receiving on every wave. Uh, if you looked at our income with 10 children, there's no way we should eat. Much less pay the bills. But God has been good and, and God has put people in our life to help us along the way. But it's been that sowing and watching and sowing and watching it come back in. So we just ask you to do one thing. Hear what the Lord's speaking to you about when you give tonight. We believe God for this budget. We're, you're not our source. But you get to be a part of this meeting. I want to say this. Do you understand that, that when, when Dr. Barkley leaves here tonight. And, and he's going over to Georgia. And we're blessed to be able to go with him. And, and we continue this conference. And then he goes on and preaches at other places around the country and around the world. Do you realize that your seed and that you get to go around the world. Because of a seed and never leave your house. Do you understand how powerful that is? So I want you just to be a part of that tonight. We're just going to believe God. Apostle, come on, man. You, you know you're supposed to be up here. Why are you not even up here with me? You're going to pray because that, that, that increase is on you. You know that. So you're going to pray over this offering, and then we're going to give everybody an opportunity to sow, and then we'll dismiss. Amen. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for... Dr. Barkley, our dad, giving us the word of God. You spoke through him tonight. Father, we thank you for allowing us the opportunity to sow. Giving us an opportunity to give unto you. What an honor. What a privilege it is to give back to you when you've given us everything. So, Father... We're going to cast our bread upon the waters tonight. And we thank you, God. It's going to come back 100-fold return. We believe. We got faith. And we believe that all things are possible to him or her that believes. So thank you, God, for the money that coming back to our homes. More than enough, press down shaking together and running over in jesus name can we give a big shout amen 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 all right ushers are going to you go ahead and serve the people for those of you who would like to you can give online if you guys would throw that graphic up on the screen you can go to gatheringchurch.life if you don't have a check or cash with you tonight you can go to gatheringchurch.life god there you go and you can go there and you can give online and uh don't forget to go by the tape table gathering People, we will not be here tomorrow morning. We're traveling to uh, Georgia to be in Life Church. We're going to be there. And uh, so there will be no service here in the morning. So if you show up and nobody's here, uh, grab Tucker. He'll be here. Tucker, unlock the door. Let him come pray. They need to come pray. Um, so, but pray for Cameron as he has to wrangle the cats and get them all in the van and get everybody over there in time. 
because we, we flying out tonight. We're getting out of here. Um, and, and that's an honor too. So we're headed over and we're going to continue this conference. Pray for us. As we go to Georgia to release this word and to keep people in faith. Amen. Amen. Father, bless the people as they go. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for their wholeness, God. And we thank you that we get to celebrate you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen.